Hello everyone, welcome to another day in the clown decade, the decade where things are only going to get worse before they get better. And I think I've put my finger on what the question of the decade is, and that is, what is a woman? Because I think this particular question is what you can ask someone to find out if they are ideologically possessed. If at the moment they are saying, well, it's an adult human female or something along those lines, I think it is completely possible to reason with that person and bring them around to your way of thinking. I think anyone who answers with anything other than that is someone so ideologically possessed, there is no point engaging with them unless you want to laugh, which is generally what I do. And amazingly, I do think this is question of the decade, because especially for politically engaged people, it's either entirely one side or the other. There is no middle ground for this. There is no nuance. You either live in reality or you live in your ideological bubble. And what made me make this video was seeing this two minute clip from Reason UK where they went out to see what the people of England thought a woman was. And this was just the most fascinating clip I could find about it. So how would you define what a woman is? I think that's a very difficult question. This is an example, by the way, if there is any pausing hesitation or an answer other than adult human female, boom, no point continuing on in good faith. They are idiots. Yeah, I think gender is yeah. a social construct. This is another thing to look out for, by the way, if there are any use of buzzwords. The little hamster is running around in their brain trying to find the correct cue cards for them to repeat like a parrot. It's a difficult question because gender is a social construct which was an idea only popularised in the 80s, and for some reason it means we have to completely subvert everything we know about the difference between the sexes from millennia earlier, which is patently ridiculous. Um, yeah, it's... I think especially in this day and age, it's something yeah. that is... It's, like, possibly... I don't actually... No, I think the idea of womanhood and people who are born in female bodies or with female genitalia, it's yeah. like you have this experience growing up, especially with childhood and like being a teenager, of this like woman experience. Okay, so that answers ever so slightly better. If you are born into a female body, you are likely to experience the world as a woman. That's probably because you are a woman if you have female genitalia, as being a woman means you are an adult human female. But Of course, like most sensible arguments these days, they do have to have a but in the middle of it to completely ruin the point. That doesn't... It may, it may make you different to people. I'm trying to, that when, like, assigned female at birth, like, you may have a different experience to those women, and they may have different experiences to you, but I think it's, it's, it's very, it's not a very good explanation <laughs> because... No, this is just a word salad, and the reason it is a word salad is because you are completely ideologically possessed and you don't even realise it. Oddly enough, this may come into play because she has a woman's brain. Because while the difference may not be that extreme, and obviously it's dependent on the individual, men and women are wired differently. We have plenty of research going into that. And because women typically are more empathetic than men, they will try and change their reasoning to try and be inclusive or empathetic in this way. Thing is, if you don't understand what you're actually trying to be empathetic about, when you're asked to reason through why you are feeling that way or why you feel whatever you feel a woman is, you might have trouble trying to describe it. And don't get me wrong, men will have this issue too, as we will go through later. But it's just interesting to see that three women who have complete experiences of women cannot actually define what a woman is, despite the fact it's one of the most simple definitions in the English language. And this is why I think it's question of the decade. The, the um, defining what a woman is, I think, is very uh, difficult. Yeah. Because you may, you may, on the outside, to a random person, look like a woman and be a woman, but may not feel yeah. like a woman yourself or be yeah. the opposite. And then finally, we just get to the cop-out argument of, oh, it's really difficult and it's completely up to the individual. Which, in much simpler terms, is just saying a woman is anyone who defines themselves as a woman. To which you then get circular reasoning of, well, what does a woman actually mean? You, you can't say a ball is a ball, that doesn't actually tell you anything about the ball. You need to say a ball is a spherical object, typically used as an object in sports and games. Because that gives you a hell of a lot more context as to what a ball is, rather than just saying a ball is anything that identifies as a ball. Anyway, the clip goes on. How would you define what a woman is? Oh, that is woman. a question. A amazing, two women, yet again, can't describe themselves. Honestly, these people wonder why they are mocked so much. It's because you are literally the thing. You are being asked, basically, how would you describe yourself with this particular term? Because clearly you'd describe yourself as a woman. Why would you do that? But they can't say adult human female because that's not trendy. 
someone with a vagina. <laughs> was that so hard? <laughs> was that so hard? Um, I think the reason they're laughing is because the answer's really obvious. And it is quite odd to be asked that in the middle of a street. But at the same time, if you have the ideological possession of you can't say that because it's not on brand, then you'll just pause and not be able to answer. <laughs> yeah, someone with a vagina. I don't know. No, no, not in every sense, obviously, because no. obviously no, that, that was exactly like, oh, yeah, I'm joking. See how quickly they stopped laughing and went, oh my god, that might be offensive to someone. Oh, it's not like that in every case. And then they have to go super serious. I mean, that <laughs> that is, I think, the very seed of doubt that needs to be put in these people, and they need to realise why that doubt is there. Because the reason it's there is because what they're about to say is absolutely moronic. Um, like, obviously, just feminine energy. Because yeah. obviously that then includes, like, trans women and then, like... Yeah, everything sorts, in between. Yeah. A woman is someone who exudes feminine energy. What in God's name does that mean? And it's also the typical thing that I always bring up. Why do you bother having to say trans women then if it's just someone who exudes feminine energy? And also, does that mean that someone like, say, Freddie Mercury, who was quite flamboyant on the stage, is he a woman because he was exerting feminine energy? Or do we have to dig down a little more to find that out? So, what does feminine energy entail? Oh my god, I love this interviewer. She knows exactly what to ask. Um, it's just an aura, isn't it? Yeah. I I don't, I, it's hard to explain it. I don't I know. Think it's just a being, isn't it? Like, yeah. how, how you present yourself. And I think it can be different to everyone, really. I think... My feminine energy might be a little bit different to his, yeah. different to yours, different to anyone's. Absolutely phenomenal description. Feminine energy is whatever the hell the individual decides is feminine energy. Incredible. It, it's no wonder that things are getting worse before they get better. This is the type of thing your average person thinks. And of course, the average person will be thinking this because the chattering classes and the people in the media will be dripping down what they think too, and they think, oh, I've got to think like these cool people. A big example being Ash Sarkar, who, when asked, please define a man, she says, most men are born male, every man's born male, but a minority transition later in life. Not from male to female, they just go through procedures so it is easier to present as the opposite sex. That doesn't make them the opposite sex, Ash. Whether you're cisgender or trans, you're a man if that's how you live your life complete redefining of the terms you seem confused so i hope that helps well thank you ash you have opened your mouth and made yourself seem even stupider than i once thought and as is usual with these sorts of things if people were just putting out stupid opinions i'd probably wouldn't even make a video and just laugh in private unfortunately when these ideas dissipate and go mainstream we end up with all the issues that the turfs constantly bring up you know changing rooms bathrooms single sex spaces things like that that really are relatively low-level issues, but important issues to these women nevertheless. And when these women bring up these issues, they tend to be berated. An example that I have here from over across the pond, where one was just tried to give a speech about her opinion on seeing a penis in a changing room at a swimming pool and how she wasn't a fan of it. The ideologically possessed came along and decided that they had to cause a ruckus because they have the brains of a two-year-old. And yes, with the opposite sex present. If you're on the you know really Stop! 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 And that's enough of that. As you can see, the disruption, it may not have been that disruptive, certainly not as disruptive as some things we have seen over the past couple of years, but it still all stems from the simple question of what is a woman and people's ability to answer it. Because the crux over this definition, it, it is just entirely all one-sided in reality of what a woman is. And for people who have transitioned, they are trans women. They are still male. They are still men. That's why even at hospitals, the doctors still need to know whether you are male or female, because that entirely determines which cancers and which diseases you are more likely to get. 
women can't get prostate cancer, for example, and men cannot get cervical cancer, for obvious reasons. But the people who can't define what a woman is cannot accept that because their definitions are completely off this planet. Which then forces them to make ridiculous statements like ones we've already seen, but also publish it in online magazines that are a bit more official, such as this one from Pink News. Joan of Arc didn't call herself non-binary, but gendering her isn't that straightforward. Um, it actually is. So this article's written because the Globe Theatre, yes, Shakespeare's own Globe Theatre, are putting on a production that makes Joan of Arc non-binary and uses they-them pronouns. I'm going to skip all that bit and get to the meat of the argument. The historical Joan did not use they-them pronouns, not least because she spoke Middle French. Middle French had no equivalent pronoun, though it's interesting that singular they did exist in English as early as the 14th century. Does that mean it's inappropriate to explore a non-binary Joan of Arc through art? Of course not. Art is interpretive. Alright, fair enough, I guess. But so is history. Ugh. There is no one definite historical truth, because any way we look at history is an interpretation of the past through a modern lens that is often cloudy. And here's the annoying thing that a lot of leftists do. Yeah, kinda right. Because historians have a pretty hard job of trying to construct a narrative of history with facts that they are given by historians or chroniclers of that time. The issue is, is much like the fossil record, it will be incomplete, especially as you go further and further back in time and especially in the Middle Ages as Joan of Arc lived. However, given Joan of Arc was a Catholic, given Joan of Arc is literally a saint, and given that Joan of Arc was known as a female virgin, there is absolutely no doubt in my mind that she would never have referred to herself as anything other than a woman, or with whatever the French equivalent of she and her are. So saying history is interpretive, technically true, however if you are interpreting history through a lens that is so radically anti-reality, there is absolutely no point in doing that because all your interpretations are going to end up with silly statements like Joan of Arc was probably a non-binary queen. And even then they accept it here. Joan is a particularly elusive and complicated historical figure. Cannot possibly access Joan's understanding of her own gender or how she related to the gender roles of her day. Can only look at the available source material and interpret how she expressed herself. The picture is complex. For a woman who only lived till 19 because she was executed by the English, I, I think there's a lot more important and interesting things you can cover than a gender. But this is how ideologically possessed pink news are. They have to take historical figures and make them their own. Far from a damsel in distress, Joan was a 15th century peasant girl who had religious visions and led several successful military campaigns for the French against the English in the Hundred Years' War, styling herself as La Pucelle, the Maiden, and wearing a cropped hairstyle and armour, Joan said God had commanded her to wear men's clothing. That, by the way, is part of the reason she was executed, because that was blasphemous. It also goes against Bible teachings of the time. While still a teenager, she was captured by the English and burned at the stake as a religious heretic, partially because of a refusal to conform to the feminine dress. Joan's complex relationship with both feminine and masculine traits makes her gender an interesting question to explore. Joan didn't pretend to be a man, but nor was she a typical medieval woman. The main source we have for Joan's gender transgression is the record of her trial, which is an account written by those who condemned her to a violent death partly because of her cross-dressing. This is how flimsy this argument is about Joan of Arc being anything other than a woman. At no point do we have any evidence that Joan tried to pretend to be a man. In fact, we have evidence of the contrary where she completely accepts that she's a woman and maybe these people would even say identified as one but had to get into male get-up because basically there was only male armour in 15th century France, shock horror, and was essentially a lightning rod for French resistance against the English in France. But she never actually went into battle or killed an opponent, or at least there's no historical record of it. She was simply a maiden figurehead, one that led armies into battle but didn't actually fight them herself. She was essentially an armchair revolutionary, though a lot more effective than the ones we have these days. And obviously because she was causing all these uprisings, that was part of the reason as well that she was executed. And somehow these arguments get worse. Joan called herself the maiden, but that doesn't necessarily mean that she wanted to emphasise her femininity. She believed that virginity was crucial to her religious calling. She wore men's clothing, but that doesn't mean that she thought herself as a male. Masculine clothing may have been a way to express her roles as a military leader or her sexual unavailability. 
or just the fact that if you're trying to raise an army and resistance, you're probably better off doing that wearing military attire. Though it seems paradoxical, Joan is likely understood her own maidenhood as a masculine trait. Her expression of gender was bound up in medieval Christian ideas about virginity, martyrdom and divine instruction that don't correspond with the experiences of modern women or non-binary people. Joan was divinely inspired to lead France to victory and willing to die for a cause. This very debate over which gender box she might have ticked would be alien and inconsequential to her. You're absolutely correct, and it completely undermines what you're trying to do here. Because with your title, you are basically saying, mm, Joan of Arc didn't call herself non-binary, but she probably would these days. And to be fair to them, the idea would be so alien to her but that, that there is absolutely no way that we could know one way or the other. But it just shows how completely incompatible with traditional ways of thinking, or at least historical ways of thinking, this modern or postmodern lens is. Because, as always happens with this postmodern thinking, facts get in the way! <laughs> and they've completely got in the way here with Joan of Arc, which is probably a better example of someone you might be able to call non-binary, but still a terrible one. Because, believe it or not, there's even worse examples. Elizabeth I may have been non-binary, claims Shakespeare's Globe. Academics working for the theatre have cast doubts on the gender identity of one of England's greatest queens. See what I mean? This essay, written for the Globe Theatre's blog, was written by a transgender awareness trainer in defence of the Globe's decision to stage a new play featuring a non-binary Joan of Arc, but both the play and the essay have raised concerns that the famous females are being written out of history. The essay claims that Elizabeth I described themselves regularly in speeches as king, queen and prince, choosing strategically to emphasise their female identity or their male monarchal role at different points. This appears to reference the most famous speech attributed to Elizabeth, her 1588 address at Tilbury in which she braced the nation for battle with the Spanish, saying she had the heart and stomach of a king and a king of England too. The essay on Shakespeare's Globe website, written by Dr Kit Hayam, suggests that historical women were not only rebels for performing what were considered typically male tasks, but also in some senses adopted a male identity. Well, if your most poignant example of her maybe being a non-binary person is that she metaphorically says that she has the courage and bravery and leadership of a male king, then once again you kind of undermine your own point when in the same speech she essentially says, yes I am a woman. But this is where we're up to with the whole argument of what is a woman. Not even some of the most famous women in history are women anymore, because they had to be put in positions where being a woman wouldn't have got them any success whatsoever. It's ridiculously gender essentialist, which is really ironic because that's what I should be called. To say that because they did some masculine things or some typically masculine things for the time, then to call them a woman would be incorrect. This is how ridiculous the postmodern lens is. And that's why people who try to push it end up seeming like morons. And the thing is, the professors and academics where all these ideas drip down from, when they are confronted with reality and with people who completely disagree with their postmodernist lens and writings, then they get all defensive, don't know what to say and basically don't have any good answers, as shown expertly by Matt Walsh. So, so what, what is a woman? Why do you ask that question? Instantly, completely avoiding the question, having to deflect, oh, well, why do you want to know what a woman is? Because we know that your definition is completely asinine. I'd just really like to know. What do you think the answer to that question is? Well, I'm, I'm asking, that's why I came to a college professor. It's a, it's a thing I actually see a lot of academics do when they are caught out with questions that they know they don't want to answer because they know it will make them sound stupid. It's an amazing thing with academics. They are hyper aware of the George Orwell quote of there are some things honestly so stupid that only intellectuals could think them. And this particular professor knows that the answer he is going to give is one of those incredibly stupid things that only he could believe. Yet amazingly, these ridiculous academic papers work their way down all the way to the Globe Theatre and all the way to the populace who repeat it without really knowing what they're saying and end up making really stupid statements, as we keep seeing. And this is how we're going to win. Reality's on our side. What other kinds of answers have you gotten? 
a lot of like this where you're where you're not answering. And I've gotten a lot of that. So I think it's interesting that you that you say that some of the people you've you've um, interviewed have been um, reluctant to answer it. And I think that has a lot to do with the way the questions that preceded it and the the way that you've conducted yourself in the interview. Notice how instantly defensive he's getting. He's saying, "Oh, you're an interviewer and you're being a bit combative." And therefore, you're not going to get anyone answering you because you're not being friendly. Whereas really, from Matt Walsh's conduct here, he's just being forward, saying, hey, you study gender identity and all that. Can you explain to me what a woman is, please? And OK, I've not seen the earlier bits of this clip, but from how Matt Walsh and how the professor is replying to his answers here, it seems they've had a perfectly amicable interview up until this point. How have I conducted myself? How do you think you've conducted yourself? Instantly, again, it, it, the professor needs to get in the mind of Matt Walsh, which isn't at all how interviews should be working. I mean, compare this with the John Peterson interview with Kathy Newman. If John Peterson ever brings Kathy Newman into it, it's either to appeal to her job as, say, on the free speech issue, while you're a journalist, you need free speech, or it's a, it's a competitive world, you've been very competitive, and that's why you're successful. It's never a, oh, well, what is your opinion, before he's even attempted to answer the question. Which is the reason I like John Peterson compared to any other academic. You just really don't want to answer the questions, do you? I, I came today very willing and, and enthusiastic about answering questions about women's and gender sexuality studies, which is so what you wanted I to, do. You wanted to answer questions about women's studies, and so shouldn't the, the first answer you should be able to provide is what exactly is a Notice how defensive the professor's got. He's leaning back in his chair, he's got his arms folded, he's rarely looking at Matt Walsh. This is a prime example of the Emperor having absolutely no clothes on whatsoever. And this man will be paid way more than he deserves for the things he is writing. Because that is such a perfect point to make. You are a professor of women's studies and gender. You should surely be able to describe one half of the gender binary, as well as actually describing what a woman is. It's, it's half the words in women's studies. Woman. Well, it's it, for me. It's it's actually a really simple answer, and that's a person who identifies as a woman. But what are they identifying as? And this is what the professor was trying to avoid, because as I mentioned before, they can never actually give a salient definition. It's the a ball is a ball definition. As a woman. As but, a but what is that? As a woman. Do you know what a circular definition is? I do. It's sort of like what you're doing right now, where a woman is is a woman. Mm -hmm. So he just completely agreed. It's a completely useless definition. This is your professor of gender identity and women's studies, a man who cannot define woman unless it's a circular definition. Samuel Johnson would be rolling in his grave if he saw this is how intellectuals are acting these days about definitions. And yes, I did have to Google who invented the dictionary. Well, because you're seeking what we would call in my field of work an essentialist definition of gender. I think it sounds like you would like me to give you a set of biological or cultural characteristics that are associated with one gender or the other. I'm not seeking any type of definition, I'm just seeking a definition. Yeah, and I gave... Uh, yeah, there I think Matt Walsh should have reiterated and said, I, I want you to give a useful definition, because circular definitions are not useful whatsoever. And as I say, I think these academics, are they're never going to have interviews like that again. They're going to try and stay in their ivory towers and within their departments and faculties, writing this complete nonsense, spreading it out throughout the world behind their names with nobody being able to have proper discussions about what a woman is. Despite the fact that majority of society knows exactly what a woman is, because it is literally ingrained in our brains to recognise the differences between men and women. Otherwise, we wouldn't survive as a species, given there needs to be recognition between men and women so that we can procreate. But I think what really made me want to make this video is a little anecdote that I had recently. So I was at one of my friend's weddings, and there were a few people from uni that I hadn't seen in a while. And one of these people did a biochemistry degree, or a degree in that field. And so this would be a person you'd expect not to use this language, or at the very least, understand the difference between men and women. And as a joke at one point, before the wedding, when I was talking to them, I basically just said, as a joke, I'm transphobic. And they were all very confused and were like, why were you saying that? And I'm like, well, it's obviously a joke. Uh, but then you actually get onto the conversation of it. And at one point, this person who did this degree and works in the pharmaceutical industry, she used the term, oh, well, you're assigned a gender at birth, which I was actually quite shocked about. Because years ago, before this trans ideology blew up and became mainstream, we were having a joke at another university party, and I was doing another joke, basically explaining to someone 
that there can be such thing as a feminine penis. And this friend of mine was listening in and basically asking what the hell I was talking about and what I was saying was ridiculous. Women can't have penises. And yet you give it a few years, you don't really care about politics. You just do your own thing, do your own job, live your life. Sooner or later, this is how this stuff dissipates. This is how the ideas go through some form of social osmosis into people's minds that should know better. That's as long as it took for someone to use the term assign a gender at birth. Because this person doesn't concentrate on politics like I do, she doesn't concentrate on the ideas, she just repeats what she is taught because she has more interesting things to do with her life. And that's absolutely fine. But the conversation moved on pretty quickly from that. But I, I would, and I am probably going to see this person again at some point soon, but I would really like to push her on that point. I would love to know how you go from not accepting that women can have penises in 2017 and then five years later start using pretty common ideological terms such as assigned gender at birth. Because this is why I think the clown decade is going to get worse before it gets better. There's going to be more people thinking like that because it's the in thing to do. It's very untrendy to think as I think, basically, and say that, yes, when you are transitioning, you are not literally transitioning your sex. All you are doing is doing what you can to present as the opposite sex. And unfortunately, the best you can do is LARP. And unfortunately, revealed preference of, you know, dating preferences, marriage preferences, things like that, it shows that the LARP is about as best as you can do. And I know it's very hard for those of you out there that are transgender, and I do completely empathise with your struggles. But I'm sorry, these things have to be said, because trans radical activists, as most of my trans friends do agree with me, are going way too far and absolutely making their own lives hell, because they are essentially representing what transgender people are. Because it's all people are able to see these days because of the media. But that's just how the trend's going, and eventually reality will topple it, because untruths can only be perpetuated for so long but we're going to have to get through this tough decade before all that starts happening but anyway that's all i had for you today so as usual thank you very much for watching and until next time goodbye